everybody, this is Eugene Lee Show here. Welcome to episode 17 of Forensics Talks. This is our second episode of 2021. Uh, my name is Eugene Lee Show, and I want to welcome you all here today. Just before we get started, just a few quick announcements, and that is uh, some of the things that we have had going on. Uh, one is our bullet impact study. Uh, if you're a forensic researcher or you're involved in ballistics, uh, this has been a uh, a study that's been up for a few weeks. This is the last weekend for it. Um, I'm very grateful. We've had an excellent response on this. So uh, if you still want to try this out, uh, you're more than welcome to. And all you have to do is go to the website, ai23d.com, and then look at bullet impact study, uh, register, and you'll get all the information uh, there. Also, I'm going to be running a photogrammetry week. And so that's going to be a week where we're going to be putting on some free webinars where you can learn about photogrammetry, how you can use your digital camera to create 3D models. Look for that on January 26 to 28. Once again, if you just head over to the website um, or you can go to ai 2 3com and just go to register. But once you land on the website, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff there that you'll be able to see where we're going to flag you for sure uh, so that you know how you can register for that. Uh, in terms of conferences, there's a couple things going on. Uh, one is the Association of Crime Scene Reconstruction Conference that's going to be up um, on March uh, 2nd to 4th in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so that's, it was an excellent conference. I was there in person last year, and this year it's going to be a, a mix of uh, in person and, of course, virtual. And uh, finally, there's also the American Academy uh, a forensic science conference on February 15th to 19th. And so if you're interested in that one, that one is hundred percent virtual from my understanding. Uh, but, um, if you are just uh, head over to their website, which is going to be, I believe, uh, AAFS.org. Okay. Um, let's get moving here. And, uh, a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Leroy Halsey from the uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks about his research study where he investigated the collapse of the World Trade Center 7 building on September 11th. And his conclusions were very clear, and that was that fires did not bring down World Trade Center 7. And so today, uh, this is an extension and we have, uh, of that particular talk, uh, which is going to focus on the World Trade Center 1 and 2 towers. And for this, I'm very pleased to have Richard Gage with us. And Richard Gage, AIA, is a 30-year San Francisco Bay Area architect and member of the American Institute of Architects. He's a founding member of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And as an architect, Richard's worked on most types of building construction, including numerous fireproof steel frame buildings. And most recently, he's worked on the construction documents for a 400 million mixed use urban project with about 1.2 million square feet of retail parking structure and mid-rise office space, and all together with about 1,200 tons of steel framing. Now, there are a whole bunch of videos of Richard uh, speaking at conferences, virtual events, universities, and especially debates and even on the news. And he uh, has been doing this quite a while. I'd like you to please welcome uh, Richard Gage. Thank you very much for being here today. Thanks, Eugene. Great to be here with you. All right, great. Um, Richard, I'd like to ask you some questions about before you were actually an architect and when you first decided you wanted to be an architect and how, how did uh, that happen or what was the interest in architecture for you? It was just a fascinating uh, a subject for me. It, it, it came later in life. I had 10 years of wandering in the wilderness, if you will, uh, doing various uh, labor and so forth, but then I ended up uh, helping out, running blueprints in a in an architecture firm. So I said, "Wow, this looks fascinating." So I took some evening classes and ended up at USC uh, to to uh, get a full education and apprenticed with architects in the Los Angeles area, and uh, became an architect. And I've been loving it ever since. Okay, we we've been talking about, uh, or we're going to be talking about, you know, a lot of tech, some technical stuff. And usually, architects are often praised for their creativity. But in fact, to be an architect, and you can comment on this, but you have to know something about engineering, about science, about structures, and that sort of thing. Would you agree? Yeah, we have a lot of engineering classes in architecture. In fact, I was the student uh, teacher for structural engineering uh, for the uh, freshmen that were coming in. And I enjoyed that quite a bit. I, I like the technical end of architecture uh, rather than those who excel at the design end. I, 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 I um, put buildings together, construction documents, 
and make sure the buildings get built properly with the construction administration services. Right. Well, do you, I want to ask you about 9-11 and everybody has a, I think a, a, a very, fairly clear memory of where they were, but where were you on 9-11? In my apartment, getting ready to go to work. Um, uh, we're watching the uh, towers uh, uh, on fire after the planes hit them. And uh, I think we saw live um, on TV uh, in Walnut Creek, uh, where I lived uh, the, at the time. Uh, and uh, the, the t this, we saw the towers coming down. It was just flabbergasted in shock like everybody else. And um, I understand that it wasn't until about 2006 when you first became really interested in the investigation and in the towers. And so I'm, I'm curious about, there, there was a gap there. So during that time, were you, you know, like everybody else, just, uh, did you believe in the, you know, you, it was the official story and you were fine with that until what happened? Yeah, I had swallowed the official story hook, line and sinker, like uh, most everybody else, because I didn't have alternative evidence available to me to look at, like we do now with the body of evidence that uh, 3,000 architects and engineers have now uh, put together and are disseminating uh, and crying out from the rooftops uh, around the world. Uh, I heard David Ray Griffin on the radio at Bonnie Faulkner's Guns and Butter program, uh, and uh, never before this had I heard any alternative explanation as to how these towers came down. Uh, but here's uh, Dr. Griffin talking about... Uh, the, the Twin Towers with lateral ejection of steel and uh, trailed by thick white smoke clouds and falling uh, 600 feet in every direction away from the Twin Towers and the, uh, the uh, explosive testimony that he had just been uncovered by Graham McQueen uh, with 118, now 156 first responders talking about and experiencing sounds of explosions in the tower before they came down right and and you uh and i want to talk about some of these items that you're raising up here because and and i want to focus on the the, the evidence and the scientific evidence and i don't want to give you a free ride okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna try and ask some hard questions i've been watching the debunkers and all the other things but uh you know um you make some very compelling arguments. And initially there was the 9-11 uh, the Commission report. Uh, it looks like it came out in July 22nd, 2004. And it was established, uh, the commission was established in looks like November 27, 2002. Um, what can you tell me about some of the comments that the people who are on the commission had to say about the way the commission progressed or the way it was handled? Well, uh, one of the uh, commission members, Senator, Senator Max Cleland, resigned from the commission, citing that it was a national scandal that um, the investigation is now compromised. And uh, we have the leaders of the 9-11 commission, uh, and, and they're citing that, um, that they were lied to uh, by the White House, by the CIA, and by the Air Force. The Air Force gave them uh, three different versions of events, all of which contradicted each other over time. So uh, we have a, a lot of problems with the 9-11 Commission, which never even addressed uh, the third worst structural failure in modern history, and that was Building 7, which we discussed, uh, you just uh, discussed with uh, uh, Leroy Halsey. Uh, that building was uh, a 47-story skyscraper, part of the World Trade Center complex, wasn't hit by a plane, but it came down at free fall acceleration straight down uniformly into its own footprint in under seven seconds. So uh, that wasn't even mentioned in, in the 571-page uh, 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 report, which was written by uh, Philip Zelikow, a Bush insider, uh, and, and he had complete control over the staff and uh, over what questions even the commissioners were asking, certainly what got into the final report. Hmm. So when doing a, a, an investigation in the world that I live in, in forensics, I mean, preservation of evidence is extremely important. Otherwise, how do you do a proper investigation? Um, so in this case, um, how available was the evidence or what happened to the evidence when, you know, when it first became available? Well, starting two weeks after China, 
uh, after 9-11, the evidence was shipped to China on, uh, on barges. Uh, so the forensic investigators didn't even have proper access to it to do a, a real investigation. Uh, there's only 250 pieces of steel saved. And um, fortunately, uh, some of those were actually um, analyzed by uh, FEMA and put in their Appendix C of their uh, Building Performance Assessment Report, which came out in May of 2002. And in there, they document that the steel was uh, sulfur dated. It was, there was a hot sulfur corrosion attack on the steel with liquid molten iron. They had no idea where the sulfur came from, no idea where the molten iron came from. So uh, th this is evidence in, in the steel that they did manage to save, which was like 0.02% of it, um, uh, that uh, there was uh, something else going on here besides fire, because fire doesn't create these uh, opportunities. It doesn't melt steel. Right. And I think that was the official story that the, you know, the, the jets crash into the building, that the fire, you know, uh, the, the jet fuel ignites and that there's an explosion and it just keeps burning and burning and burning. And eventually the steel succumbs to the heat and everything just uh, falls from there. I'm, we're going to definitely get to that. For our viewers that are here, I just want to uh, just quickly ground you and just give you an idea of the World Trade Center and the locations. So um, here on this particular uh uh, slide uh, you see where it says WTC2 that's the south tower WTC1 is the north tower and up here is WTC7 and I think we we'll probably mentioned this if you haven't seen the, the previous one before but WTC7 was not struck by an aircraft but it did collapse later that day at about 5 p.m. and uh, here's just another view um, if you want to look at the timeline at about 8:46 a.m. American Airlines Flight 11 crashes into the North Tower that's here excuse me, that's here. And uh, it, it was between the 93rd and 99th floors at about uh, 9.03. The United Airlines Flight 175 crashes into the South Tower, and that's between the 77th and 85th floor. Uh, about an hour later, the South Tower collapses, and then about um, half an hour later, the North Tower collapses. And WTC7, which is down here, that doesn't collapse until the end of the day. So that's not until about, uh, you know, 5, uh, 5.20 PM. And again, that one was just uh, office fires and there was no, um, you know, no air, 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 aircraft fuel or anything like that. So um, it's that's that's kind of the gist of what we're talking about. So let me ask you this, Richard, um, fires. Let's talk about fires because everybody is, you know, thinking that these fires caused collapses. Do we have anything historically that even reflects a similar type of failure to these buildings due to fire? We've had dozens and dozens of fires in skyscrapers before 9-11. Uh, not one of them has completely collapsed. Uh, fireproof steel frame buildings have not collapsed due to fires, office fires, uh, normal office fires. So not before 9-11 and not after. After 9-11, we have uh, several examples, uh, very notable, where the buildings are completely engulfed in fire and for hours and hours, and they do not collapse. So here on 9-11, all of a sudden, we have three uh, steel frame high-rises that collapse due to fire. One, as you mentioned, not even hit by an airplane. Had a few small scattered fires uh, around it. And yet it comes down symmetrically at free fall into its own footprint in less than seven seconds, indicating that not one of those columns gave any resistance uh, to the collapse. Well, where did they go? Uh, they could only have been uh, taken out by controlled demolition, which is the process that is used by uh, demolition companies to bring high rises down to the ground uh, at free fall and often symmetrically. Okay. Um so one thing that's that I've always thought about in terms of the towers is that the the initial failure seems to happen where the planes impacted. And I was wondering if you have a comment on that, because it looks like where they happen is where the collapse first begins in both cases. Yes. Um, these are deceptive controlled demolitions. Uh, we are asked to believe that the 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 airplane impacts and the fires are the cause of these collapses. 
Indeed, the official story tells us that uh, due to the raging fires on the floors in these buildings, uh, the, the, the floor uh, sagged, uh, which pulled in the perimeter columns, uh, apparently all the way around the building at once because these, these, uh, the upper part of the building above the point of jet plane impacts then, according to the official story, drives the rest of the building down to the ground fairly symmetrically. And uh, uh, that's the official story. And this was uh, uh, supported by a paper which was submitted just two days after 9-11 by Zdenek Bazant from Chicago Northwestern University in which uh, he documents with an extremely complex mathematical calculation, which has been decoded finally by engineers who have challenged his, his results. He has rigged the calculations uh, fraudulently 12 to one in favor of a collapse by increasing the mass of the falling body above uh, by three and decreasing the ability of the strength of the columns below the point of jet plane impacts uh, by four and then eliminating an entire story of columns altogether so that he could develop a false dynamic uh, impact on the floor below. So this is completely fraudulent and yet it remains the key theoretical uh, uh, analysis for NIST's column failure theory which I described below. But as you can even see yourself in the collapse of these buildings, um, what we have is a sudden collapse. The building is standing still, uh, and then all of a sudden, the top goes down in uniform control, uniform motion, very smooth. It doesn't hesitate as one floor is hitting another and then uh, stop. It's accelerating from the very beginning at two-thirds of freefall acceleration as documented by physicists. So uh, th this means that those columns gave up virtually all of their strength, 90% of their strength, just like uh, Building 7, which gave up 100% of its strength. In these buildings, you then have the lateral expulsion of four-ton and eight-ton structural steel sections ejected laterally at 80 miles an hour, trailing thick white smoke clouds, as you can see in all of these uh, uh, videos of the tower's destruction. Well, the built, steel is not flammable under office fire conditions. So why are steel beams, which are not flammable, uh, trailing thick white smoke clouds? Well, that is the evidence of iron uh, of um, of uh, aluminum oxide uh, ash, basically, which is a byproduct of thermite, which we'll get into later. The so we have um, also squibs or isolated explosive ejections uh, laterally out of the towers, uh, even 20, 40, and 60 stories down below. Uh, you can probably see some of them in, from this view here. No, nope, that guy's going to turn and run for his life. I um, hope he made it. And But you see the uniform uh, ex destruction of these of these explosions, hundreds of them, all the way around the building, like a belt, these first responders described them. 156 of these first responders describing sounds of explosions, uh, uh, flashes of light before the building comes down uh, and throughout the building. And so this, these, this order of events, of the description of events by these first responders, very credible expert witnesses, are describing uh, all of these, uh, the, this evidence of explosions well before, seconds, many seconds before the building even comes down. The official story tells us that these explosions are a result of the building coming down. No, the, the witnesses are very clear. One of them says, for instance, all of a sudden the ground just started shaking. It felt like a train running under our feet. The next thing we know, we look up and the tower is collapsing. Another says you could see the tower sway and then it just came down. So this is the kind of uh, uh, quality of witnesses that we have. Shortly before the first tower came down, I remember feeling the ground shaking. I heard a terrible noise, and then debris just started flying everywhere. Right. I could read you dozens and dozens of these quotes, which go on and support each other again and again. 
evidence and testimony, which is backed up by the seismic evidence, which shows the existence of explosions before uh, the towers even begin to descend, as well before the airplanes even strike the towers. There's evidence of explosions and witnesses of such uh, in, the, uh, in the North Tower. Well, I want to ask you a couple of things here because you've, you've, you've unloaded a whole bunch of stuff there. So let me ask you one thing here. This is the North Tower on my screen. And one of the things that you've pointed out before is you can see the, the top section as it's starting to go down is actually leaning over. It starts to lean over to one side and then it's coming down. But the bottom part of the building seems to be resisting for a few seconds. Um, so that would imply that the top is just imploding in on itself. Is, could that be due to fires? We're told that the upper section of the building above the point of jet plane impacts drives the rest of the building down to the ground. And what you're describing is what everybody sees on the videos is that no, the upper section doesn't even last. It, it's telescoping in on itself, uh, which means that uh, it's being destroyed. Just like if you ran a Volkswagen into a Mack truck, the lighter structure is the one that is destroyed. Well, the lightest part of this building is the upper part. It can't possibly uh, destroy the heavier, cold, hard, intact steel below. And none of the videos show or photos show the upper part destroying the lower part. They show that it's destroyed in the first four seconds. After that, what's happening? We have these massive explosions described by the first responders again and, and the hurling of these uh, uh, heavy structural members in all directions and then these squibs uh, or isolated explosive ejections uh, all of that is happening, tearing the building apart from the inside out. So these are explosions, evidence of high energy explosives. And there's also evidence of, of um, thermite incendiaries as well. We'll get to that later. Okay. I want to ask you about the squibs here because uh, these are these, these jets of smoke that are, or I'll call them puffs or jets of smoke that are coming out of the building. And I've, I've sort of freeze framed on the video here, but you can see one of them on this face and one of them on right here and if i just scroll back and forth you can see that they're ejecting and they're much lower than where the collapse is uh, sort of uh you know it's w many many floors up above now could this be due to the inside collapsing and there's some kind of air pressure that's being pushed out of the the elevator shafts or out of the offices this is what nist tells us that this upper section of the building is driving the rest of the building down and creating this kind of a piston uh and and that air has got to come out somewhere well, um, first of all, we saw that that upper section was destroyed in the first four seconds. So it's not producing a piston. But even if it was, uh, this is not air pressure. Uh, this is solid objects being blown out of the building. And you, we're just seeing two here. There's actually dozens and dozens of them in the many different views of these buildings' destruction. Uh, if that was air pressure, it would uh, come into the open office planning that was... Uh, uh, unique for the World Trade Center towers with 60 feet between the core structure and the exterior structure on two sides of this building, that air would uh, fill that uh, that uh, space. And then if it blew out any of the windows, it'd blow them all out, not these highly focalized, pinpoint accurate, violent ejections that we see in, in, in these videos. Uh, no, and they're occurring at about 200 feet per second. This is not air pressure speed. This is the speed of explosives. What can you tell us about the, the distribution of the components? And this was, uh, I think this was in the WTC, one of the, either the FEMA report or something. I don't remember exactly where I pulled this now. But um, if you look at the location of uh, World Trade Center 1 and 2, these uh, rings that are around there is basically the debris field. And it's really interesting because um, there are heavy steel columns that are getting basically pushed or blasted out by, you know, like a couple of football fields or so. Um, what is, what is the debris field to tell you about, the, um, where the evidence has landed and the magnitude of this collapse? Well, yes, uh, the, these, um, structural steel sections, uh, land up to 600 feet in every direction. Uh, characteristically uh, d destroying the World uh, Financial Center and specifically the uh, the uh, Winter Gardens there. Uh, and so um, we, we have the dispersion of 99% of the steel beams 
outside the footprint of the building. You look at the, the collapse that's left there, and you don't see uh, 20, 30, 40 stories of, of debris. Uh, no, you see about two stories of miscellaneous steel and so forth. Uh, the rest of it is outside the footprint, which means what? It means it could not have contributed to the collapse of the building. It is outside the footprint up to 600 feet. So uh, that's a third of the weight of this building. So what destroyed the building if it's not the weight of the steel? Well, maybe the concrete. But the concrete we see has been pulverized to a fine powder in midair. Huge clouds of concrete which settle in a three square mile area around the World Trade Center across lower Manhattan from river to river, three inches thick dust, a powder, which is powdered concrete, 30% of it by the uh, dust samples that we have. So the concrete was also distributed well outside the footprint. So together, the steel and the concrete is two thirds the weight of the building. It's not even available to crush the building. So what destroyed the building? Well, the evidence is in the explosive evidence and the incendiary evidence that we're looking at today. All right. So let me ask you about the powder, or at least let's talk about chemical evidence that's been found in the powder or residues. Um, what can you tell us about some of the work that was, that's been done by, is it Niels, Niels Harris and maybe some other people about the chemicals and the substances that have been found surrounding the World Trade Center? Well, let's start with the official reports by the U.S. Geological Survey, who do studies on the dust, along with R.J. Lee, an environmental consulting firm, which did a lot of studies on the dust. And what do they find? They find molten iron microspheres, previously molten. They're, they're the size of, uh, almost naked to the human eye. Some of them are up to a sixteenth of an inch. They have no idea where they came from. They're elemental iron. So this is not even melted steel. This is molten iron, previously molten iron. There's uh, up to uh, four tons of this material throughout the World Trade Center dust, up to 6% of many of these samples. They have no idea where they came from. R.J. Lee says they're formed be during the event, not before, by the iron workers, putting the, the welders putting this building together, not afterward by the iron workers taking it apart. But during the event, well, where would four tons of molten iron microspheres even come from? Another team, uh, you mentioned Niels Herrett. He's the leader of an international team of eight scientists who put together a, 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 the answer to this question in the analysis of these red-gray chips, which at first they thought they were paint, as they're, they've been collecting seven independently collected samples of these red gray chips, red on one side, gray on the other. The red side is attracted by a magnet. Uh, well, the whole chip is. At, but So they zoom in to the red side, find that it's predominantly iron. So this is not paint. They put it in a heater, a differential scanning calorimeter. It ignites at uh, about 750 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And it produces a whole lot of energy. So this is an exothermic uh, material. They get real curious, zoom in 50,000 times with an electron microscope and find in the red layer these, uh, these nanoscale uh, 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 particles of iron oxide and aluminum powder. What is that? That is the ingredients of thermite. Thermite is iron oxide, which is basically rust, and aluminum. But this is extremely finely engineered uh, down to the nanoscale, a thousand times smaller than the diameter of a human hair, these particles are. And they're set in an organic bed of oxygen, silica, carbon. Uh, they, this is the organic material that causes uh, TNT to expand rapidly, causing the destructive concussive force that's associated with that. Incendiaries work by means of heat. So here they have apparently engineered this material, of which there's uh, up to uh, four tons of this material by extrapolation of how much is found in each sample uh, throughout the World Trade Center dust, four tons altogether. So you see, uh, they, 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 um, they also find that when they put these in the heater, 
it produces not just a lot of energy, but what? Molten iron microspheres, proving exactly where all of those molten iron microspheres came from that the USGS and RJ Lee uh, before them uh, documented very, very carefully in, in, in publicly accessible peer-reviewed papers. So we know where those spheres came from, uh, as if we didn't know, because they're found attached to partially ignited red-gray chips that are found uh, throughout the World Trade Center dust samples as well. So you see, this is a, a self-corroborating set of repeatable experimental data that could put a lot of people away for a long time as the real perpetrators of 9-11 because this proves how the World Trade Center towers came down, especially when you look at the ends of the steel beams, uh, which are have incredible quantities of, of slag and 45 degree cuts on the steel, uh, which is characteristic of controlled demolition because they cut it at 45, so one column slides off the other instead of getting stuck. Uh, um, that's just what they do. Also, so we uh, have evidence of thermite found on the on the sculptures that are still existing around the United States uh, and Canada, that pieces of which slag were sent to Stephen Jones, nuclear physicist, formerly from Brigham Young University, who does these kinds of tests and finds that the ends of the beams have and shouldn't have thermite residue uh, on them. So this is just damning evidence to the official story. There was something, uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, something about like uh, a melted, they called it a meteorite, and it, it looked like some some iron, something that like lava, a piece of lava almost that solidified. And there's even, uh, I believe there's some of the firemen that who attended, there's one very famous one where he says it was like a foundry and that it was like lava flowing you know, days after the, the, the towers in the debris. Yeah, there should not be uh, molten iron or molten steel. And that, and that is uh, described uh, by dozens of witnesses as well. We have photographs of it um, uh, flowing like, a, like, like in a volcano, uh, one of the firefighters says. Well, it, it takes 2,800 degrees to even begin to melt steel. So where are these temperatures coming from? These, these office fires are, are the, the, the hottest they ever got, according to the documentation that even NIST has is uh, three or four, maybe five or 600 degrees. That's a quarter of the temperature and energy necessary to melt steel. Well, thermite produces molten iron and aluminum oxide ash, uh, but molten iron at 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it very much uh, describes and accounts for what could have happened to this steel, especially since the evidence of thermite is found on the ends of the beams through X-ray energy dispersive spectroscopy performed by these uh, these engineers who are studying the forensics of the of the steel. What about people who are saying that you know uh, the evidence of these paint chip things are coming from the paint or from some other locations? Could it have uh, originated from some other source? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by some other source. The fact that it's there in all the World Trade Center dust samples and documented in this 25-page peer-reviewed study in the Bentham Open Chemical Physics Journal so well clearly documents that uh, paint does not have these properties, these exotic properties, uh, where it can, it can uh, produce a whole lot more energy uh, at 758 degrees and produce the same molten iron microspheres that uh, uh, chemically, the chemical signature is exact same as those which are produced and found by the U USGS and RJ Lee and all the World Trade Center um, samples that they analyzed, but they have no idea where they came from. Mm -hmm. So if they don't have any idea where they came from, then, uh, and, and, the, and the paint chips explain them, then it's just pretty clear what's going on here. Yeah. So nanothermite um, is something that's going to burn through the metal, but is, is it going to behave differently than, for example, dynamite, where it's going to make a loud bang? Like, is, is it still going to make, because the sound is, is it's an interesting point. I mean, you're, you're, you're mentioning here that people are hearing uh, explosions and that sort of thing. But when we look at the uh, when I look at the video, I mean, I don't see flashes of things burning, especially on the exterior columns. So 
is it just is all that's required to you know basically sever all the beams on the interior or or what do you think happened here well that's where they are they're on the interior even the exterior columns are are shielded by uh, aluminum panels and fireproofing and so forth the firefighters uh, at least a dozen of them saw flashes of light before uh, around the building uh, at all different levels uh, in in the building um, so there is the process of controlled demolition normally involves high energy explosives like TNT, which use a, a, a very loud issue, a very loud bang and a bright flash. Uh, now that's more characteristic of controlled demolition, like the old hotels that we see. We see those flashes, we see those bangs. So I understand why we'd be looking for them here, right? Uh, thermite works very differently. It, it produces intense amounts of heat and, and, uh, and, and muted explosions, because explosions are still heard, as you've heard me even uh, uh, quote uh, two or three of the hundred quotes that we have from the 156 altogether from the first responders. Um, but it's not as, as intense. Uh, so apparently in a deceptive controlled demolition, uh, they chose to use uh, a technology that doesn't have the audio and visual signatures characteristic of typical controlled demolitions. Okay. Um, let me ask you about World Trade Center 7. I know we treated that in a previous episode, but I think it's still important to touch on. And that's because um, Dr. Halsey did a very thorough investigation on that one. And I mean, having read his report and having read the NIST report, um, I was very impressed with his work because he's really taken a serious look at the structures and, and trying to model it as accurately and, and in a conservative fashion too. Whereas NIST, um, well, I wasn't impressed with the report. They left out a lot of things and, and uh, it seems like there's some problems uh, with that report. But do you think that you're going to have an opportunity to do a similar thing with World Trade Center 1 and 2? Yes, we, we, we are. We have the structural drawings now and we're proceeding with that. Okay. Oh, that, that will be very interesting for sure. Um, um, it, it, anything else you can say on who would be working on it at this point or? Um, not yet, but our, our engineers on our staff are starting the process now. Okay. Interesting. Um, with respect to World Trade Center 7, um, that was not struck by an aircraft. And so it was office fires or debris that landed from the North Tower that hit. And what what I found interesting was the side that gets hit first and where the fires start actually start to wrap around the building and go to the far corner where they suggest the collapse uh, initiated and, and there was a sort of total global failure. Um, where does, uh, or where do you, or where does architects and engineers stand right now with Dr. Halsey's report? What, what are you doing with it? We're sending it to every engineer, civil engineer and structural engineer in the country. Um, and, uh, it, it, well, we're sending the, the announcement of the study to them and the abstract. We're sending the actual copy to every in university in the country that has a civil engineering or structural engineering degree. Okay. And so we've also uh, made a film called Seven. Oh, yeah. And uh, that one is about 45 minutes long. It interviews the uh, structural engineers that work with Professor Halsey to produce uh, this uh, study and interviews uh, Professor Halsey as well. So I encourage everybody to watch that on uh, Amazon and Hulu and uh, Vudu and other places. And so it's currently available now. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll yeah, there's a list of where you can find it uh, on our website, which is ae911truth.org. Let me bring that up so that people have uh, a chance to, to get there. Uh, right there, ae911truth.org. Um, I understand you're also, um, you've sent in a response to the NIST report on World Trade Center 7. Um, have you had any response from NIST? Yes, they, they wrote back. We had a 100-page a um, uh, request for correction, which you can do with federal agencies uh, like that have fraudulent reports like NIST did. And so we um, uh, spent a lot of time focusing very specifically on major problems in their report, which completely invalidate their conclusions. Any one of these invalidates their conclusion that this building came down by fire. Or these, uh, yeah, building seven. So uh, 
they wrote back very superfluous um, uh, answers that basically say we stand by our our uh, our work without answering the specific questions or pointing out, you know, how it could even be possible that um, that there their their, their their lies could stand. So uh, uh, they so they they wrote back denying it. So we've we're, we've appealed this now, and it goes to the top guy at NIST. Uh, and and we're expecting a response from him uh, shortly. So if we're not satisfied with that response, which is what we anticipate, we will be suing this. Okay. With respect to uh, evidence and, if, and the fact that, uh, for example, World Trade Center 1 and 2, do you have a hard time finding drawings, getting access to, I mean, if they destroyed all the evidence, is there anything around that can still help you? Oh, yeah. 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 Sure. There's um, pieces of sculpture with evidence of thermite on them all around the the world. Actually, uh, 256 pieces of steel were saved. Um, particularly the one documented by FEMA, which has silver dollar size holes in it. Uh, the ends, uh, the, the the web of the beam, a half inch thick, uh, thinned to razor sharpness. Uh, they describe uh, a hot corrosion attack on the steel, liquid molten iron invading the boundaries of the steel grains. So uh, all of this is is uh, quite available and, and damning to the official story, as is the video of the destruction itself and the eyewitness testimony and the forensic testimony in the iron microspheres and the red-gray chips found throughout all the World Trade Center dust samples. Right. So what, what is next for architects and engineers and what, what are your next follow-up, you know, steps to try and advance your cause? We have uh, another project uh, where the uh, Jeff Campbell, who was murdered in the 106th floor of the North Tower, um, he's from England and his family has uh, begun a lawsuit uh, to get a new inquest into his brother's death, uh, which was death with explosions, uh, which can easily be proven by the damage to his body. Um, there, by the way, the, 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 there were more than 3000 people killed, but only 300 whole bodies were found. Uh, 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 1100 of them, they can't even find a trace of. They, they were basically vaporized. This is not what happens in a natural collapse of a building. So uh, we, we have raised $100,000 to hire one of the best lawyers in London to take this on, a former coroner himself, actually. So a very, very important uh, uh, work, and that's going to be submitted uh, in January uh, to the uh, Attorney General of uh, the UK. So we expect uh, good results uh, from that. We've also sued the FBI because they were responsible for taking, getting all the evidence that they've collected since the 9-11 Commission came out, the report, and giving it to Congress in what's called the 9-11 Commission Review of 2015. Well, we've given them our evidence in many different forms, including the 25-page peer-reviewed paper on nanothermite, which we mentioned, and uh, one of our lectures. And they've written back and saying they've got it. And in fact, regarding our lecture, they said it's backed by, seems to be backed by thorough research and analysis. So they actually watched it. That was Michael Heimbach who wrote that to us, uh, the former uh, chief uh, counterterrorism assistant something like that, um, at, uh, at the FBI, but he's gone now. Anyway, uh, we will be suing them because they did not make this available to Congress, which is what they were commanded to do by Congress in 2015. I see. Wow. We also have uh, one more uh, uh, legal action in which we have submitted 60 exhibits to the Attorney General in Manhattan, uh, proving that these towers came down by controlled demolition. And um, that was... Um, it's, it's been some time now. We've gone back and forth with them trying to get them to prove through a man because we submitted a mandamus action requiring them to prove that they have actually submitted this to a special grand jury. So we're that's that's pending some back and forth. 
Yeah. Why do you think it's so hard for people to accept, uh, or you know, what the the evidence or what you're presenting? Is it just uh, because of the the unrest that it would cause, or you know what I mean? I would think that you know, because of all the loss of life, you owe it to the families and the people to sort of bring out the truth or or try to bring out as much of the truth as possible. Yeah, only the truth is going to heal the wounds of the families. Sweeping the truth under the under the rug. Uh, might make some people feel better for a while, uh, but eventually it's going to rot, uh, and uh, our the collective consciousness of our nation uh, it, it, it can't, can't handle uh, too many truths being swept under the rug. Uh, it's it's all coming out uh, these days um, uh, sideways. So let's get straight to the truth. That that's what's going to heal the families. That's what's going to uh, stop another 9/11 attack. From happening again. That's what's going to stop the phony global war on terror, which has consumed $6.5 trillion and decimated our civil liberties, where any of us now can be arrested without a right to a lawyer, a trial, a jury. We can be put away indefinitely. Uh, that's through the Patriot Act, the Military Commissions Act, and the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012. Uh, so th this is... Um, really uh, important. The truth about 9-11 uh, will uh, pull up uh, all of these, um, this string of deceptions, which uh, have been foisted upon the American people. Okay. Hey, what kind of resources can you uh, tell the people who are going to be watching this video on where they can go to find reports or technical evidence, whether it's uh, what different types of social media outlets can they go to find out more? Yes, uh, we're on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, AE911Truth. We have a website, AE911Truth.org. We have Twitter, AE911Truth. We have Facebook, AE911Truth. So I think that should get people where they need to be. Yeah, I think so. Well, look, Richard, I'm, I know you're a busy person, and I really appreciate you uh, being on here and, and giving us some great information. I know that you have a ton of information, and uh, I'll tell you what, you, you've got some real determination because you've been doing this since like 2006, so more power yeah. to you, and I hope you keep going. <laughs> so good Thank for you. you. Um, hey, I'm, I'm going to just uh, pull you off here. i just make a closing, and then, uh, but, but hang on. I'm just going to say uh, I'll come back on with you in a bit. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. All right. All right, folks. Well, that does it. Uh, that's for uh, you know, really interesting information. Um, if you have not uh, pursued this, uh, please find out more, uh, learn more, go online, uh, learn both sides of the story and make up your own mind uh, based on the evidence that's out there. I, I find it truly fascinating. So that does it for this one. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about forensic toxicology. And I'll have uh, Harry Millman, who has a book out called The Science Behind the Deaths of Famous People. So you'll learn about uh, pharmacology and toxicology. Thank you very much, everyone. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.